calling to order the June 13th, 2022 Committee of the Whole. Um, huh, that's interesting. Um, first item up on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Do you have a motion? To move. Okay, I have a motion from Robert Mack. Do I have a second? Second. And a second from Ms. Green. Any questions? All right. So then the motion is to approve the agenda? Yes. To approve the, adopt the agenda. Okay. Please vote. <laughs> Guess I need to vote. I don't have a motion. Plug this in really quick. Did you get it? Yep. Oh, all right. Motion passed. Sorry, I, my computer wasn't plugged in, so I was not doing anything else <laughs> under the bias. Um, the next item on the agenda is 2A public comments in person. Um, thank you, Ms. Darby. So we don't actually have any in person public comments. Um, today, but we do have, we did have two submitted online, uh, one in reference to uh, the rezoning of the Carolina Park area, and the second uh, having to do with uh, wanting a parent wanting to check on the status of calming rooms. Uh, it'd probably be great if um, someone can follow up with that parent because she was asking for some instructions. Um, and Dr. Taylor, if you can just let me know how to do that, I'll direct her. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Darby. Great. Thank you. Um, the next item 3A is superintendent's report. Oh, it's right there. God, I'm sorry, Mr. Tenney. I'm flustered today. Good afternoon. How are you? Good. All right. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Darby. So the superintendent's report today, we have several areas. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, the agenda, um, we have a short video to highlight the graduations uh, that took place um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we also have in the presentation in the PowerPoint, uh, th uh, three slides that highlight some of the uh, uh, graduation events. So we'll show the video, you can look at the, um, actually what I'll do is I'll show the slides for the uh, uh, for the highlights and then we'll do the video. And then next, uh, Ms. Brower will talk about school uh, security update. And then we have a, uh, principals from the D20 downtown schools to talk about their uh, ESSER 3 uh, collabor collaborative proposal. And then Mr. Hamer will uh, make a presentation on the FTEs associated with the uh, ESSER 3 uh, funded. So uh, with that, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, go to the next one. And if we could um, maybe minimize the, uh, the view to the right. Uh, thank you. And so again, uh, these are um, uh, each of the high schools that uh, that we had graduations um, week before last. Uh, Academic Magnet High School, uh, Baptist Hill, uh, Burke, and Early College High School. Uh, so those are pictures from those uh, four schools. Uh, Charleston School of the Arts, uh, James Allen Charter High School, uh, Military Magnet Academy, uh, North Charleston High School. Uh, then um, Stahl High School, St. John's High School, Wando High School, and West Ashley uh, High School. And I think that's uh, it. And I will say also that uh, I think I was I attended all of those graduations except for one school because uh, so it was um, it was um, I think Reverend Mack was at each one that I was that I attended. So it was a good good uh, representation of what happened uh, uh, for the school year. So, so with that, could we take a look at the uh, video, please?
I come today to tell you just keep moving and always remember to keep your focus. I want people to say, man, those 2022 grads, they represent their village very, very well. Class of 2022, you have persevered despite insurmountable odds. I want to congratulate each of you for the commitment to serve our country. And most of all, class of 2022, don't stop believing. One, two, three. Class of 22! And now, a huge congratulations to the class of 2022. Guys, we finally made it. That you go forth into your new adventures and do so to the best of your ability. Because of them, I am the first in my family to graduate high school. Our lives are about to change, and it is up to us to continue what we started here, healing the world through art. I'm asking that you try to excel in everything you do and strive for excellence in every task, large or small. As we go out into the world, I hope you find your cause. I hope you find your community, and I hope you find what brings you joy. Thank you to everyone who got us to the point where we are now. All your work won't go unnoticed, and we will make you and ourselves proud. Save for the moment. You only get to walk across the state once. So uh, thank you very much. So you can see from the um, graduates there that it was an exciting um, three days, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, it was also very inspiring, and I was uh, very grateful uh, to be um, be there with a, a fellow with uh, board members. I know uh, Dr. French was, was at a number of the uh, events. I saw Dr. Fraser as well as Ms. Darby. And so um, again, it was a, a great event, a series of events. Mm -hmm. So next, um, we'll have uh, Ms. Barori um, give the school safety uh, security updates. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. I've asked uh, Mr. Reidenbach to, to join us at the podium to provide this overview, but we took the time to uh, give the board an update and give the public an update on where we stand as far as our security protocols go. Uh, we've got an extremely successful program uh, that we continue to build upon. Um, and I did wanna take the opportunity by, before I turn it over to Mr. Reidenbach to remind uh, you all, if, if, if you don't recall, that Mr. Reidenbach is one of the four finalists in the nation uh, for the campus security manager. Uh, he'll find out next week if he's the uh, nation's representative for that award. So I didn't want to take the opportunity to uh, thank for all the work that he's done. That's a tough one to beat, Michael. Thank you, Mr. Broy, for that embarrassment on this Monday morning. Afternoon, members of the board, welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for allowing us to take a moment to, to talk about school security. Obviously, last month's shooting in, in Uvalde, Texas, has brought school safety to the forefront of many people's minds. Uh, since that incident occurred, we've heard from uh, many of our parents and staff and administrators uh, with concerns about school safety. But I find that in times like this, when, when we when we're in the aftermath of a, of a critical incident that's impacted a school anywhere in this country, uh, that it can be empowering to take note of, of the things that we do have in place to keep us safe and the things that we can do to, to take control of our own safety. Uh, this unfortunately is not the first time we've been here. Uh, we have faced uh, many school incidents, school tragedies across the country. And anytime any of those incidents happen, we always take a, take a, a thorough look at our program. We look at what happened in those situations to determine what can we potentially do uh, to, learn from, uh, to learn from those incidents, to uh, see if there's anything we can do to better ourselves, to put us in a better position to uh, protect ourselves against uh, any variety of threats that could impact our schools. And so when we look at the school security program that's been built over many, many years, uh, and it's been uh, bolstered after we've learned lessons over the years, uh, we look at our measures really in four big buckets. We look at our emergency planning, drills, and, and training. Uh, we look at our physical security measures, 
our threat reporting detection and assessment processes, and then our school security personnel. And so really at the heart of any school safety plan is making sure you have an, an all hazards emergency operations plan. And this is our school districts. Uh, this was created over the, this was significantly enhanced over the past several years um, after uh, Parkland, um, our office added a position of the emergency preparedness coordinator uh, to really focus on things like this. And this is really fruits of that labor um, that allowed us to significantly enhance the plan that we had, added a lot more detail, created a formalized student reunification plan that had not existed in the past, uh, established the district's first continuity of operations plan so that we can uh, maintain operations um, during disruptions like hurricanes or pandemics. Um, and so that's, that's been a great addition, but a plan is no good to you unless you know how to implement it and people are trained. And so uh, we conduct staff training throughout the year, at least twice per year with staff. Uh, we conduct tabletop exercises with, with our principals and district mm -hmm. leaders uh, to make sure that if we encounter one of these situations, we at least have, have established a, a foundation within our minds of what our response uh, should be to deal with that, that hazard. When we look at the physical security measures we have in place in our schools, we try to implement a system called defense in depth, which means we try to establish various layers of security within the school in anticipation of one of those layers potentially failing. So we don't want to rely solely on one security measure to stop a particular threat. And so when we look at the various layers of security with fencing, with cameras, with exterior door locks, with interior procedures for identifying intruders, for interior door locks, for our school security staffing and SROs. We try to put all of those things together to create a comprehensive school security plan and then have, have protocols in place to manage visitors as they enter our buildings. The third bucket, which is a really, really, really important one when it comes to uh, preventing a school tragedy is threat reporting, detection, and assessment. Uh, having positive relationships with our students and having open lines of communication between students, parents, and staff is critically important to potentially identify an issue before it becomes uh, a, a threat that's carried out. And so when we get information about uh, a potential threat or a potential issue, we act on those immediately, and we do so 24 hours a day. If we get uh, information from a principal or if our, uh, our network monitoring system uh, detects uh, that a student is on their computer typing into Google Docs or sending an email that indicates there could be a potential issue, we receive those 24 hours a day and we immediately engage with law enforcement to, to, to launch an investigation. Uh, if, if a lot of times we're able to, to assess those threats and deal with them that night uh, and perhaps put some additional layers in place the next morning just to, to bolster security. Um, but being able to quickly respond and get interventions in place is really, really important. And another tool that's used in that is the formalized threat assessment process. So uh, when students uh, show that they could be a, are demonstrating that they could be a potential harm or have expressed a threat. We have an assessment process to determine, are they actually a threat? Uh, there's a difference between making a threat and imposing a threat. And so that assessment is there to determine whether they pose a threat and to put the interventions in place that are needed to, to stop them on that, that path uh, toward intended violence. And then finally, we utilize school resource officers and security personnel. Uh, we have four primary <laughs> law enforcement agencies we work with across the county to provide uh, SRO staffing. Um, which are sworn law enforcement officers that are employed directly by uh, the municipalities or the county. Um, in addition to that, we have members of our security and emergency management team who support schools every day. Uh, our random search and safety team uh, conducts random searches in our high schools, and they also have a comprehensive uh, school security assessment program uh, that they employ in the schools to evaluate uh, not only the physical security measures in the schools, but how procedures and protocols are being implemented in those schools. Mr. Roy, Mr. Kennedy, that concludes the update. Uh, thank you very much. Um, any questions from the school board? I just wanted to say thank you very much. I, I think it's very reassuring for the community to know what we already do and do every day. Thank you, ma'am. Reverend Mack? Uh, thank you uh, for the report and for the update. Um, so I know that we have a comprehensive plan in place and we've been blessed to not have had any type of um, incidents that have occurred that have evolved in other shootings in schools elsewhere. But however, we, we are uh, finding weapons in our schools. Uh, guns are actually getting inside of the building. So I guess my question becomes what measures 
do you suggest that we could uh, potentially move forward with in trying and making sure that those weapons do not cross the threshold into our schools? Because we know that they're there. Uh, and we've been, as I say, we've been blessed to not have, have any type of shooting of any nature of that, but, but, but they're getting into our schools. So I guess, what is the next step uh, in making sure that those guns and knives do not get into the building? Yes, sir. The technology in the area of weapons detection is significantly changing and becoming more enhanced. And so when we look at the procedures, our random search and safety team is utilizing, we, we're looking at potentially leveraging some additional technologies to help us increase our impact uh, in that program. Uh, we just had delivered to us today a, a, a device that we're testing out um, to see how we might be able to integrate it into our search and safety team to uh, allow us to enhance uh, and increase the number of students that uh, that we're visiting with that program, um, because the the more impact we can have, the greater the deterrence element will be uh, with that program. So that's one area we're we're looking at. Um, you know, additionally looking at when we do have a weapon that's found inside of a school, what kind of formalized response plan can we put into place um, or intervention plan for that school? Can can we potentially employ um, at that particular building? At the end of the day, though, creating those uh, those pathways, those abilities for students and staff to report potential concerns, potential brewing conflicts is really, really important to help prevent uh, the possession of that weapon translating into an actual uh, shooting. And so we want to continue to enhance the ways we do that. Uh, just this past year, we implemented a, a tip line a tip line that was dedicated towards students for them to uh, email uh, tips that could be processed through uh, our 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 reporting system. Um, additionally, we have the, the telephone line um, that's available for students to, to, uh, to, to submit anonymous tips. Um, so I think continuing to look at those areas and enhancing those is, is something we're working for. So uh, two things. Uh, on the tip line, is there a reward given to students? Not currently. Not when they're submitted directly to us, no, sir. Okay. It, it may be something that will get them to really want to report it in, in the end. The second thing was, uh, we did a pilot before, uh, and I know the pilot came back that uh, the assessment amount of time it takes to really go through each student's backpack. I think it was a, a team that was put together, and there was kind of an assessment that every student that came through the door backpack will be assessed or, or won. I, I believe, Mr. Barrow, we, we did uh, some type of a pilot like that before. Um, Rock, yes, sir. We, we didn't do a pilot, but we, we studied it and we reviewed it with the high school principals back in the day. Mm -hmm. And that did lead to the recommendation from the high school principals that Mr. Reinbach brought forward that the board approved to establish the security, the safety and security team. And that was the solution, the initial solution to that challenge. And so that was implemented uh, two to three years ago. No, yes, sir. Two to three years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, so each school has its own team, or that's just a response team. No, sir. It's a it's a ro it's a roving team. So randomly, uh, inspection sites and uh, rooms are are selected, and Michael's team works with the with the principal to conduct that that inspect that uh, that search. But it's completely it's completely random. There's no uh, advance notice to individuals in the school uh, that it's coming. So it could be at any school on any any given day, and they're out there uh, they're out there conducting uh, essentially. These uh, these searches every day, pretty much every day. Yes, sir. Yeah. So if it's the pleasure of the board, or the board would agree to it, uh, I believe if we can get a more in-depth per school incident report uh, of what have occurred and what practices may have been put in place, and just for us for us to be able to assess and to review, uh, I think it'd be helpful for each board member uh, for that report to be given to the board. Yes, sir. Right. Thank you. Anybody? Oh, uh, Ms. Herder. We've also piloted things like bulletproof doors for classrooms, correct? Where, do, where are we stand with, with that particular pilot? So, th so three years ago, we did have a pilot program in which we installed three uh, bulletproof doors to see how they would operate uh, on a daily basis. Those uh, doors were in place and then removed at the end of that pilot program. Uh, again, when it came down to uh, making recommendations to the Board of Trustees for uh, increasing security, that was not one of them, uh, to include those across the board. Uh, installing a, a bulletproof door in, uh, in every school classroom would result in, just for materials alone, a $24 million investment plus installation and delivery. Uh, when you look at 
uh, the narrow window or the call window, the narrow opportunity for those doors. Um, you've still got exterior windows. You've still got uh, drywall walls between doors. Um, we just looked at the overall value of that and felt that the, the resources were better spent in other ways. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Brooklyn? Um, I just want to say thank you for the measures that were, you know, that you're taking to do all of this stuff. Um, I just always like to say it's a shame that these are things that we have to do. Being a parent, being a mom, I'm a gun survivor. I lost my only brother to gun violence. So even when I look at these things right here, it's almost, you know, hard to think that this is what we have to do. However, when we're thinking of when we're piloting programs as far as safety, um, are we also looking more into the reason that some of these children may be even taking these weapons to school. So when I think of random searches, random how, random and how they're being chose to be searched, because as I walk even in this building, I'm a licensed gun carrier and that uh, machine is right there in the front. However, I come right there to the back end. I've never been asked, not to say that I do, but I'm well aware, but those are the things like he's saying that they actually get in there. And once they get in there, what are we actually doing? And beyond those measures, I went to an event a couple of weeks ago in reference to this and to watch a seven month old child with a bulletproof vest on, it said a lot. Because when we're thinking of measures of when I went to school of hiding under the desk from books falling on your head from hurricanes and being able to survive from water, now are we actually thinking about putting our children in bulletproof vests as another measure? of protecting them. So again, how are we actually taking those measures? How are these actually being randomly and who are we deciding to pick and choose when we decide to search these people? Yes, ma'am, so to, to the, the random uh, selection process, uh, in order for the, the program to remain legally compliant, the selection process has to be completely blind. So we uh, assign numbers to every classroom in all the high schools, and our team gets together once a semester with, with somebody from it's the finance division, actually, to help us randomly select numbers. Uh, and then we look at this. So we'll select the number between 1 and 50 for that school. We look at the classrooms because there are 50 classrooms in that school, and our random number was 27. So we'll go to our list and say number 27 is room 321. And that is going to be our, our room for, for that particular search. We don't know what class is going to be in there that period. We don't even know at that point what date has been selected. The date selection comes later. Uh, but we have a formula that is used to ensure that uh, the frequency of searches across the schools are, are consistent, and that the, the selection process in the classrooms are completely random. And there is no uh, conscious decision that comes from our staff in the selection of the school or the, the classroom. It is literally all formula based um, that is blind to, to what, what class is there. And as Mr. Burroy mentioned, uh, the school doesn't even know what room we're going to until we, we arrive uh, on the campus that day. Thank you. Yes, all right. Anybody else have a question? Um, Dr. Frazier and then Dr. French. I just have a comment. I completed a study on the security plan for Charleston County School District several years ago and um, polled several of our high schools, Stone, North Charleston, and Burke High School, found out that um, the security measures really mean so much to our staff. And I have the results of that. And I'd like you to take a look at what the staff is saying about um, the security measures that we have in school. So at some point in time, let me share that study with you. So it will give you some additional information on what we might need to do. One thing I'd like to bring out to those of us in here is that it did show that the, um, the when you walk through the um, security, that it does not deter violence. And that's in that study also. So if we could connect, can you give me your number? Yes, ma'am. Share that study. Thank you. you. All right, Dr. French. Yes, I'd also like to um, ask, how do you assess the culture for every day living in the school? And I know that we don't want our schools to feel like a high security prison or anything like that, but we, I think that 
Um, we know of incidents that have occurred because of doors not being properly latched. And this is a everyday culture that is hard for people to accept because it feels unfriendly to walk out a door and not let someone in. Um, but I also want to know if we have um, made sure that all of the security camera, that all of the entrances, even if they're not meant to be entrances most of the day, have cameras on them. Uh, because that's, that's one way guns are getting in is people are letting people in alternate, alternate doors. But I've also heard from some staff that there's issues about seeing outside of the building when they're letting people in the vestibule. So they have to go out to look to before. So I hope that we're updating that for everybody. Um, but I do think it's a community thing that we all have to do our part to stay safe. Absolutely. And thank you for the comments. You hit the nail on the head with the fact that this is a community issue. It really does require all of us working together, our students, our teachers, our administrators, our parents, and even just concerned community members who have a, an interest in the schools. And when there are concerns seen, when there are observations made, uh, that those are reported to the proper authorities so they can be, be properly investigated. Uh, the number of, of doors in a school certainly create um, a vulnerability that we have to address, and we, we attempt to do so with a placement of cameras at, at entrance doors, even if they aren't designated as an official entrance, have, uh, have that visibility. Uh, over the past uh, several years, uh, we were fortunate to receive a federal grant from the uh, Department of Justice that allowed us to install, uh, that allowed us to to lock the front, very front doors of the schools. If you remember uh, many years ago, you used to be able to walk in that front door, but be stuck in a vestibule. Uh, so we were able to push that security layer out one, uh, one layer uh, and lock that door and put a video intercom there uh, so that if they don't have visibility to it uh, naturally, they'd be able to utilize the camera on the video intercom to screen individuals. Uh, the purpose of a physical security measure is to, to help us do three things, help us better deter a threat, detect a threat or delay a threat. Um, and so the more time we can build between us and a potential hazard, the more abilities we have to detect a hazard uh, before it's right on top of us um, or what our ultimate goals with the security measures um, and, and, and putting the intercoms on the front doors was a, was a, a big win for us. If, if I can add to what Mr. Reidenbach said, uh, we have more than 5,500 cameras across the school district. Uh, the funding to replace those systems in, uh, in large part to what the board's directed, so I appreciate of what you all have approved in, in the past that allows Michael to replace the systems uh, when they're needed. And as far as adding cameras, uh, we, we take on requests all the time. If a school uh, identifies a nook or a crevice and says, hey, this might be an area that there's a potential issue, uh, Michael takes those requests and we add cameras to those systems, uh, either with those requests from the schools or through assessments that Michael's team does. Thank you all very much. And Mr. Reidenbach, please thank your team who works so diligently on this 24 hours a day. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, next, uh, continue with the superintendent's report. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you, Michael. So we have the uh, District 20 downtown uh, principals are going to give a, a presentation on their collaborative proposal for the use of ESSA funds. Uh, staff is uh, developing a uh, schedule uh, that would allow uh, each uh, each district, each constituent district to have their principals come in and present their plans to the school board. And so over the next couple of months, we'll have, um, have principals from across this, the county uh, doing just that. And for this evening, the kickoff of that process, uh, we'll begin with the D20 uh, principal. So I'll turn that over to you all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Chairman Mack, distinguished board members, Superintendent Don Kennedy. I'm Janice Malone, principal at Sanders Clyde, one of the D20 principal on this collaboration. So excuse me, I'm not feeling my best today, but thought it was important to be here. As we thought about The Excuse work me, that do, has do you want to sit? Done? Do you want to sit and make your presentation? You can. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, you can sit and make your presentation right there. 
Thank you. Thank you. I just thought it was important to be here and be a part of the team. Uh, I'm working in District 20 and having the experiences that we've seen. And I hear often about failing schools. Why is your school failing? Why are the test scores low? But for us, it's more than test scores. And the difference between a failing school and high performing school we know is high parental involvement. And we know that's a critical element that's missing for a lot of our families. And so we thought about the analogy of any of you participated in the Racial Equity Institute, what came to mind for us was the equity of the fish, well, the analogy of the fish and the fish being our students. And our students come to us and we think about how do we fix them? How do we get them to perform academically and why are they continuing to fail year after year? And we throw interventions and referrals and suspensions and expulsions and everything at the fish. But we have to consider the environment the fish comes to us because that fish has to re return to that environment every day, every year, year after year for the rest of their lives. And so we thought about how do we help that fish? We have to think about the lake in which that fish comes to us and the contamination of the lake, generational impact of that lake when I sit in my office and I think about my families, and I had a young family, a mom, and most of our families are young, single moms. And one mom, her child has missed 34 days out of school. And she transferred in from another school. And she's in a zero percentile. And I said to that mom, we can't help her if she's not here. And the mom shared with me that where her mom died the year before and she was just depressed and she just could not do anything. And she was just there. It's her daughter's in third grade. She had a second, a, a two year old and then 11 month old on her hip. And I said, Mom, but if you send that child to school, well, maybe we can take at least her and give you time to get yourself together. She said, I just don't know what to do. My mom was the only one that used to help me. And I said, that two-year-old could be in the Head Start. She, I don't know what to do. I said, Mom, how old are you? 28. 28. And she said, I have no one. And I said, have you finished school? She said, no. And the tears began to roll out of her eyes. I said, what if you had some support? You think you might want to finish school? She looked like, is there hope for me? And then I had another mom just the other day, her third grader missed 45 days out of school. And I told her, I think I need to retain him. But she came in my office on the last day and she said, Ma, she said, Miss Malone, it's my fault. Please don't take it out on him. I work and I have to go to Mount Pleasant. And sometimes they're with my mom and that's the only help I have. And he helps me with the other children because she has a first grader and she also has a two-year-old. And she said it and sometimes he's my only help but please don't take it out on him. I said, we have summer camp. He can come to summer camp. I said, mom, how old are you? 24. He's in the third grade and she's 24 years old. And talked. I said, mom, if you promise that we can get him to summer school every day. 
And she said, you know, I used to have a principal named Miss Malone. The PE teacher was also named Miss Malone. I said, I, that was me <laughs> at Mary Ford. She said, I was in Miss Williams' class. That was first grade. This is the mom that was once in first grade. She said, Miss Malone, I just feel like giving up. I just feel like giving up, but I can't. And I don't want my children to know what I'm going through. I said, did you finish school? She said, yes. I said, how would you like to have an opportunity where someone will support you and coach you and remind you of some of the things that you can do or who you can call or where you can go for help? She said, you all would do that for me? And she started to cry. She said, Miss Malone, would you give me a hug? And I hugged her for the longest time. And she said, I haven't had a hug from anyone in so long. And then another mom with three more kids with no support. Her mom is dead, two brothers killed, a grandmother in Florida that she has no relationship with and a two month old newborn, $2,000 behind on her rent and housing. She lost her car because she couldn't get anywhere. So these are stories after stories. But then they tried to send their kids to school. And then the young teachers are supposed to work a miracle with all of the obstacles, our fish, are coming to us from that lake. And so when I have parents, young single moms with children in elementary, then in Simmons Pinckney, then in Burke, who are experiencing the same problem because that same family needs someone who thinks that there's hope for them when they think that they can get their GED or possibly know that there's a possibility that they can take a trade again, that all hope is not lost on them just because they are the parent. But these parents were once that fish. So it's not only about the quality of education that we want for our kids, but life, quality of life for our families. And if they have some of us, all of us who said, let's help them, then maybe there's a reason for them to know why the education system can make a difference. And so I went to my colleagues and we say, let's do this. Let's try this. No, we don't have all the answers, but we have to do something because we see these faces. We hear their stories. And so that's here we are. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Swinton will come next. Thank you. Ms. Malone, we love you dearly. But Ms. Malone, Ms. Malone, we love you dearly, but get some rest, please. We know you work hard. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Get some rest. Good afternoon, Chairman Mack, distinguished board of trustees of Charleston County School District, Mr. Kennedy, our superintendent, and to our leadership here. I am Cheryl Swinton, principal at Burke High School. As Mrs. Malone so passionately shared, we came together to talk about ways in which we could address the critical issues that impact the students that don the doors of our particular schools. As a collaborative group of principals in District 20, we believe 
the goal of students reading at grade level by fifth grade is embedded in the cultivation of a strong feeder pattern. A feeder pattern that works concertedly to strengthen the academic progress of the students we serve. We are confident that with a rigorous foundation established at the elementary, middle schools, and then supported by the same at the high school level, our students will be provided the opportunities to ultimately graduate ready for college and or the world of work. We recognize that schools are, and more specifically students are often judged by their test scores, whether it is SC Ready, PASS, ACT, SAT, EOCs, MAP, their GPAs, and grades in general. Whether it's the school report card or the student's individual report card. We know with this in mind, that a successful educational experience requires an integrated approach. And so we are approaching instruction and learning divided in several strategies. The strategy that I want to share today is related to student support. Acknowledging the current academic loss and the challenges socially and emotionally that our students have incurred as a result of COVID-19. Our focus is to create a culture that supports what we ultimately know is our goal, and that is for students to graduate college and career ready. By the end of this project period, June 30th of 2024, students at the participating D20 schools will show a 15% increase in their performance on the appropriate metrics. We also hope to increase college ready and career ready based on SAT, ACT, AP, dual credit and college and schools courses so that ultimately we may improve the graduation rate by 5%, increasing students receipt of AP passage scores by 10%. Our hope is also to impact retention rate by decreasing 10% and recovery needs will decline by 10% as well. The strategies we hope to utilize refer to extended learning opportunities such as early bird and after school tutoring, summer tutoring, summer camps, studies, teams, etc. We also acknowledge that our students need support socially and emotionally. So we intend to include wraparound services. In this particular strategy, we hope to provide activities whereby students have opportunities for age appropriate ex exposure, such as cultural enrichment activities like plays, recitals, entertainers, lectures, TED Talks, tours, et cetera. We believe that information and resources that provide historical experiences and information about our students' heritage will also impact their success. Ms. Malone mentioned the opportunity for adults to come in and to gain technological skills and career training through evening classes. We see this not only as a collaborative effort for our feeder schools, but also for our students and their families. This collaborative effort with our D20 schools, along with our community outreach and engagement, will provide the academic and social emotional support that our scholars need. We thank you for your consideration and your time. Good afternoon, I'm Wanda Sheets to the board, Mr. Kennedy, the superintendent and our chairperson. I would like to present strategy three. Strategy three, excuse me, strategy two. Strategy two is actually the strategy that addresses the lake that Ms. Malone spoke about. 
In this strategy, we will provide holistic support for identified families, which each of the schools have identified already through mentoring, encouragement, and supporting and helping them access resources needed to improve students' overall successful academic achievement. Because the bottom line of everything that we are doing is academic achievement. We have four goals that we wanna focus on. The first is to decrease grade retention, both high school and to provide recovery courses where needed. Our next goal would be to improve our attendance and with our students. As Ms. Malone spoke about, many of us experience high degrees of absenteeism and tardiness. And I think for the elementary level, the tardiness is really hurting us. When we have children that come to school 10.30 and 1.30, the day is over. Most of the instruction has occurred. The next goal we want to address is to decrease our discipline problems. Even though we have various levels, we know that also impacts our academic success. If students are suspended or expelled, the learning is not taking place. Our final goal is to provide our go for a more favorable rating for our schools. Oftentimes we hear negative things about our schools and many of the folks that are addressing or making these negative comments have never ever been in the school. Whereas people who have been in the school are coming out saying positive things. So we want to try to change that image by inviting these folks in. And hopefully many of these people will be at our expo on Saturday, June 18th. How do we plan to do that? One of our big pieces in supporting and, and addressing the pollution in the lake is to hire our family coaches. Right now, based on the number of students we have identified, we think that we would need about 40 coaches, family coaches. Each coach will serve five families or five children, depending on the size of the family, because many of us, the, there's a family in the school and it may have four or five children. So the number of children that the coaches will serve will vary. Next, we wanna look at our wellness services and our wraparound services, which Ms. Swinton addressed. Mental health, social emotional health. We know we've just coming out of a pandemic. Our things are still looming from the pandemic. We want to make sure that we are addressing those needs of our, not only of our students, but of our families. Many of our schools already have things like the dental van or the telehealth card, but we want to make sure all of our schools are equal in what we have when it comes to those kind of services. Parenting classes. As a Title I school, that is a requirement. However, we wanna make sure that we are addressing the needs of our student, of our parents. Um, many of our parents need services that may not be a part of what Title I is offering. And we wanna make sure that we are addressing that. Simple things as why is it important for your child to be to school every day and on time? Family engagement making sure that our families have access to Wi-Fi. We experience big gaps in learning due to lack of um, Wi-Fi services. Transportation for our families. And then we know the fish also needs those social elements, such as sports teams, such as um, ballets, such as plays. We need to expose them to some of the finer things um, that more affluent families have access. I know when Lion King was here, we took almost the whole school. That was a feat in itself, but we were able to do it. And of course, we could not use Title I funds, but we had many friends that pitched in and addressed. And I was just amazed at the kids' knowledge and the excitement of seeing the Lion King, which I enjoyed also. <laughs> Finally, family education, which has been addressed. Many of our parents do not have a high school education. 
I listened to one parent who was so upset when a discipline issue happened with her little girl and she boohooed and she was angry and she's getting a whooping. And we said, hold up, this is a conversation. This is a learning opportunity. And she revealed to us, well, I don't want the same thing to happen to her that happened to me. She actually had her at 12. Mm. So these are the kind of stories that we hear in our schools. And this is why the D20 Principal Collaboration Program knows what we need to address. We knew this long before even doing our first meeting, but our SICs and our parents are heavily engaged and involved in wanting to see this effort go forth. Thank you. Good afternoon, board, chair, all dignitaries in your appropriate places. I'm here to speak about strategy three, teacher recruitment and ret retention. The teachers are a part of the lake. If we feed the teachers, then the lake will increase and it will improve. One of the things that we notice about District 20, living on the peninsula, the cost of living is a little bit high. A lot of our teachers come in to the peninsula. A lot of our teachers or younger teachers have families. Well, they're having to commute to take care of their younger children. One of the things we wanted to do was to take care of our teachers. One of the things we could do was to put in a daycare as a part of this proposal. By putting in a daycare, we alleviate some of the stresses of having to go back and forth with taking care of your own child. If they're here on the peninsula, they know exactly where they are and the care in which they're in. Also, of course, it's a financial incentive. By decreasing some of the, the cost to daycare, that's a pay raise to some of our teachers. So we wanted to take care of our teachers. Another thing we wanted to do, if you sit in on any conversation between teachers and leaders, the word support comes up. Well, support means a lot to different people. When we talk about support, one of those things is through professional development. This proposal builds on the great foundation that CCSD already gives our teachers, but it is strategic to our specific needs as a district. The things that we have to deal with, such as what you've already heard, are something that we have to have intimate conversations about within our own communities. So by utilizing some of the time that's allowed to us, by using some of the financial um, things that are in the proposal, we'll be able to align and do some articulation and speak to the needs of our families, not just today, but generationally. And that's a game changer. We are thrilled to be able to work together and to have this opportunity as district leaders to come together and discuss our common issues so that we can come up with common solutions. We thank you for the time that you have taken to look at this proposal and to hear us and to listen as we have listened to our school improvement councils. We have taken the time and we look forward to moving forward. I now present to you, Dr. Barbara Dillagar. Good afternoon, Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm overwhelmed by what I have heard and I've heard it so many times. And so to the chairman of the board and the board, most esteemed uh, helpers in this progress and our staff, and especially to Ms. Anita Huggins who has helped us walk this trail together. We are so grateful that the superintendent opened the invitation to the principals to say, bring me something that might make a difference and I will try to support it. And these principals took that to heart and they took their problems and collapsed them into what's common, what can we do? We have proximity, we should make uh, take advantage of that proximity. And so I was invited to join the group to help them put together the proposal. And it was my delight because knowing and understanding 
what they face every day and being able to be a part of perhaps something that might end up being a solution that might be replicatable, that might help not just District 20 schools, but all schools in our district as well as outside. And to be able to share some successes of things that I have had success with in other states in the union. It, it's just the hypothesis that you want to have to prove it can work. So thank you for that opportunity, Superintendent. Thank you for inviting those principals and principals. Thank you for taking him up on that offer and making it worth their while and worth the while of our children. I want to invite you to our expo. We did send um, an invitation along with excerpts from our proposal to the board members. Our expo is Saturday from 10 to two at Burke High School. And we have invited all 71 of the people who submitted grant um, applications to you earlier in the year. We have invited all of the churches that we heard were um, interested. In fact, we've, all, we've invited many, many organizations, fraternities, sororities, and social service agencies. And so right now we have about 36 registrants and we are really pleased with that. We get calls every day, is it too late? We told them tomorrow is the cutoff. So we anticipate that we'll have a few more. We're very excited. Our t-shirts came in on Saturday <laughs> and we weren't expecting it that soon. So we invite you to join us if it's just for a walkthrough. We've given every opportunity to every organization we knew of to join with us as we look at wraparound services and community support. We are so excited about this and we thank you for the opportunity to allow us to test the hypothesis that we could change the lake, we can change the culture, we can change the habits. We only have two years, so we're off and running. And hopefully it, the research tells you it takes three to five, but we're gonna have to double that time to prove ourselves and we're up for the game. Thank you so much. Um, principals, thank you all very much. Dr. Delgard, thank you very much. I hope uh, Ms. Malone is, uh, will um, recover from her, her illness uh, quickly. And uh, thank you all for developing the proposal, presenting the proposal, and then we'll see what next steps look like. Uh, are there questions from the board? Dr. French. So having dug into the proposal a little bit, I was impressed with what they had put together. And my, my only concern, I'm glad to hear that other principal groups are going to be allowed to come and present proposals later on. Will we have an, do we have enough ESSER funding that's not already committed that we could support similar proposals across the district? Uh, just, you know, they have come first, obviously, and they had some help from Dr. Delagarde. And I'm hoping that we're providing similar support to other principals that might be interested so that they can put together a good proposal as well. But I want to make sure that we are providing equity across the district in terms of financial support. Well, as you know, uh, Dr. French, uh, all, all schools were allocated a, a certain dollar amount on, uh, on the ESSER three funding. It was based on the number of students that uh, were below grade level. Uh, each each uh, constituent district, the principals that uh, in those districts were were uh, given the opportunity to collaborate with a proposal, you no know, collaborative proposal. Uh, I think most, I think most districts uh, uh, um, determined that they would submit individual school plans, and so that's what will be coming forward to the to the board with the other constituent districts. Those individual school plans. Uh, it, are there opportunities in the future for more collaboration? Uh, perhaps as we do our analysis, uh, financial analysis, how dollars are being, uh, being uh, expended. Okay, well, then I have a follow-up because it's my impression that this proposal involves dollars over and above 
the extra do dollars that were already allocated to each individual school, uh, it was presented as a separate dollar amount. So I'm concerned that that you're saying that that is that true or is that not true? So there is some overlap in the individual allocation to the D20 uh, schools with the uh, collaborative uh, proposal that's before you know that's been presented uh, this afternoon. Um, we also indicate to other principals that uh, you know if they wanted to reconsider how they pre present their uh, handle their their ESSA funding, we we certainly. Uh, open to that and we'll collaborate with them on that. Okay, good. Because I think like daycare for staff, uh, that's obvious something a lot of organizations want to provide, but if we only provide it in one district in our school, in our one area of our school district, is that fair to all the other districts? That's that's the kind of thing I'm concerned about. Thanks. And, and I will also say the intent was not to to uh, dictate to the principals on how they would um, re respond with their their allocations, but to give them the opportunity to uh, uh, to make that determination. Thank you. So uh, thank you uh, for the presentation, um, and I wish Malone, Miss Malone, was still here to hear. But I was really taken uh, by just her opening up with the presentation of dealing with the lake and the fishes and. That's in the lake, but however, uh, I really do uh, applaud the effort of how uh, this proposal was put together, and uh, talking about you know wraparound services and and the whole component of how we of how we clean that lake, right? And those those fishes that's in the lake, and I'm using that because that's the term that you guys spoke on the entire time. Uh, but I think it's something uh, to what Dr. French was saying. Uh, I believe this becomes to be a, a pilot of a model potentially that could be used across the district if you know other districts so desire to uh, implement something of this magnitude. I think uh, when we look at learning uh, and improving what's possible in education, uh, it is building a component such as this to be able to, to launch it out to the community and to everyone to say, hey, this is just not uh, an idea coming from the school, but this is a, a joint based type initiative uh, from all stakeholders. And uh, so again, you know, we, we start someplace. I think this is a good model uh, that can be shared and could be launched to other uh, district as far as looking at maybe someone to help bridge because every area has different uh, areas of you know, interest that in the community in which they serve. So uh, again, it becomes to be a model. So again, I just want to say thank you principals for um, uh, in Dr. Delgard for putting together this and launching uh, the efforts uh, moving forward to help change what's possible in D20. So that's just my comment. Thank you. Any other, Ms. Waters? Um, I just wanted to um, uh, well, what's already been shared, I totally agree with, but then um, also just wanted to thank you all for having such a focus on community, um, parents, and just the needs of the people who are in the system, because it's important, and I don't think that we talk about it enough. Uh, I do have one question, um, which is, and I didn't hear anybody talk about it. I did see the org structure, but once the so I, I'm wondering about the program director, if you all, just because you kind of got to get running so quickly, already um, have in mind, or if you've already begun that process, just wondering where you are in the process of getting the people up uh, and running and plugged in to carry this through. Thank you for that question. And um, from the very beginning when, uh, Superintendent Kennedy told us that we are off to the races. We've been working with the HR office here, uh, developing the job description to match the systems. And we've been working with other offices too. So um, the, we don't have anyone in mind for the time being. I'm serving in that direction until, and to keep things moving until we hire that person. And um, so, so we are on the move with those job opportunities and and uh, recruitment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Frazier? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just thought this was an excellent, uh, excellent work. Uh, Dr. Dillard, you remember years ago when I tried to open a parenting program at Archer and it turned me down. So <laughs> I am so happy 
that this district is opening their eyes to understand that we have to have parents involvement with their kids. Uh, the question I have, and I don't see it here, and you're going to have to do this. At some point in time, you're going to have to have someone to go out and visit these homes. So make home visitation one of the strategies within this presentation. I can address that. Thank um, you, ma'am. The family coaches, that's gonna be one of their, actually one of their duties. So okay. they're doing home visits um, with the families and the parents. Great, wonderful, thank you. Uh, Ms. Coakley. I just want to say thank y'all. I was one of those fish. <laughs> and then I became a part of that pond, right? So like y'all said, and it's fish, not fishes, Reverend Matt. But <laughs> <laughs> I was one of those fish. And thank y'all for all the efforts that y'all are putting into that. So thank you. I agree, bravo. Yeah. Good job. Brother Mac, I have one more comment. It's Ms. Darby. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. That's Darby. Okay. okay. I, I'm so accustomed to Reverend Mac taking the lead. He's, he's in charge as well. Thanks. Okay, great. Always. Uh, the other comment I'd like to make is that we are spending an enormous amount of money on consultants. And it's very painfully. Um, making me overwhelmed, I guess I want to use the word, to know that we are hiring people to come into Charleston County. When he had, we have competent people right here locally who know our families, who know this community, that know this district. So I'm going to be complaining. I'm going to be going to Channel 5. I want this board to know that we just don't have to spend millions of dollars to fly people in, to put them up in hotels, to make them come in to earn a living for their families. And we have people here who are competent to do the work here. So thank you all for reaching locally to hire some of the people that who need the jobs here. And I just want the board to know that I will be reaching out to you to support me and looking at the consultants that we're bringing into the district. Um, I have done a for you for us to look at that. I think that we're spending too much money bringing in folk who actually come in and not do the work that we're asking them to do. I just want to make that comment. Thank you guys for using local people and reaching out to what's important for our families here. Thank you, Dr. Frazier. All right, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you very much, Ms. Darby. And uh, if we can get the PowerPoint back up and go to slide 20. And that's, uh, we're getting ready for that. Um, uh, there, uh, the board has asked to review the, um, the number of people that we have hired or plan on hiring under the S of $3, and we call them FTEs, uh, full-time equivalents. Um, so uh, a, a school system is a uh, service organization and service organizations typically, uh, the way they um, incur costs is through people. And those people are either uh, full-time employees or employees of the organization, or those are people that come in through uh, a consulting role. And so we will be presenting information uh, on the consultants that we have in the S3 program and what their roles are uh, in, at a future board meeting. Uh, this particular uh, presentation this evening, this afternoon is for the district employees that are contemplated to be to being hired under the S3 dollars. That will be presented by Mr. Steve Hamer. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. Over the last few months, we briefed the board and audit and finance committee on the investments that we're making in, in our ESSER plan. Uh, on our most recent update, uh, it was provided, uh, that was provided to the audit and finance committee meeting. It was recommended that we provide some more details that are within our plan that, that uh, address FTEs. And the next few slides attempts to give you a little bit more background and some more, <clears throat> excuse me, some more detail of what FTEs we're planning and more specifically uh, where those FTE, uh, the FTEs are in terms of instruction as opposed to support billets. Next slide. So I thought it would be helpful for this presentation to kind of take you back to the structure and the philosophy of the uh, ESSA program that Mr. Kennedy briefed at the end of April. Uh, we base this on three pillars all of them to support children reading by fifth grade 
on grade level by fifth grade by 2027. And so we have three pillars that support that. And if you recall, we identified within those pillars certain levers that we wanted to invest in. And I wanted to tie those to the FTEs that we have in our current ESSER spending plan. So again, last April, we briefed you on the rigorous grade level instruction as one of the pillars. And levers involved improve reading, improve reading curriculum, early child expansion, target supports for multilingual learners, summer enrichment program, and support for acceleration schools. Next slide. So if you look at those levers, this slide tries to show you where we have FTEs invested in those particular levers that I just briefed. So overall in pillar one, we have 51 FTEs. What's really important about this slide and what I wanted to brief you all on today is what's on the right side. Of those 51 FTEs, 39 are instructional, most of them for our early childhood expansion. So really three fourths, uh, over 75% of the, of the billets or the FTEs, I'm sorry, involved with pillar one are for supporting or for instruction as opposed to about 24% for support. So again, 51 for this pillar, the majority of them, vast majority of them are for instruction support. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit of an anomaly, but I really tried to capture for you all, all of the FTEs. This isn't as aligned closely to pillar one, but it's closer than the other ones. There are other uh, staff level billets or staff level positions that we're um, investing in. Uh, some that support our, our Chief Charleston uh, uh, plans, some that uh, are in the plans for our Office of uh, Family and Community Engagement. Uh, as our budget uh, uh, plays out here for the upcoming year, uh, we may pull some more uh, nursing services uh, billets under the ESSER 3 program. Uh, there's some ESSER management and some virtual learning uh, programs that are really carryovers for ESSER 2. So again, maybe not as closely aligned with those levers, but I wanted to make sure you had clarity on all of the billets that we're invested in. What's missing from the slide, and I'll update this, you'll have in your read aheads uh, some details on the D20 plan, which is still doing some edits on the final uh, number of, of, of support billets for that. I think in your read ahead, you have more details on this and I'll update this slide to include those. Uh, but again, those are some of the additional uh, investments that we're gonna make. Next slide, please. So back to pillar two, key levers on here involve recruitment and retention and investments that we plan on that, that we briefed you back in April. Next slide, associated with those, are 52 FTEs, but again, most of those are in instruction. Most of those in our Pathways to Teaching program, again, over three quarters of those billets aren't uh, support. They're actually in the schoolhouses supporting students and, and, and staff. Next slide, please. Our third pillar, wraparound services. Those are the levers and those are the investments that we've planned for those. And then this next slide shows you where those billets are supporting that. Now, a little bit different here, you see 100% of those um, FTEs are uh, support, but all except one of them are actually in the schoolhouse. Uh, there's a uh, wellness coordinator that's part of that 51, but even though you see 100% of those all support, those are actually in the schoolhouses as opposed to uh, senior level staff positions. Next slide. So as you're aware, uh, the structure of our ESSA program is really based on district level programs as well as school level programs. And as Mr. Kennedy said uh, earlier, we had an allotment uh, strategy where uh, a certain amount of money uh, was allotted to a school based on the number of children that they had reading below grade level. So this reminds you of the brief that we provide in April of the philosophy and the structure and the process of assigning uh, at ESSER allotment to each school. Uh, the majority of it going to our uh, uh, K through five schools and the majority of money going to the schools that have uh, more than half of their children or the students reading below grade level. Next slide. And so uh, we broke out within those school plans, uh, the number of FTEs that are within the plans. Of course, the plans include a lot of things, uh, a lot of other supports, but the majority of it again are teachers, teachers assistants, those things are supporting instruction. So nearly 80% of those positions uh, throughout the school plans, including the acceleration schools where you see 50.2 of the FTEs uh, are going towards acceleration school, uh, nearly 80% of all of those positions are instruction. So again, my purpose was to lay out for you a little bit more detail on 
where the FTEs are in our current spending plan. And again, more to the point, um, kind of demonstrate that the majority, the vast majority of those FTEs are for instruction as opposed to support efforts. Um, stand by for your questions. All right, any questions, Ms. Waters? Just want to clarify, um, the point twos, are they because some of the positions are partial? In, yes, in, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Herderick, thank you for the report. What, what's the Pathways to Teaching programs again? Uh, I'll ask uh, Mr. to help me up with that. Yes, ma'am. Those are our alternative route certification programs. Okay. So that includes Teach Charleston, Minna Charleston Teach. We also have pathways for our classified employees to become certified. Thanks. Dr. Frazier. Um, I'm next. I'd, I'd like to know, um, we're spending $10 million on improving the reading curriculum and um, from past experiences. We've had about three or four curriculums to come through this district. Most of them are in the dirt room. Are you all familiar about the dirt room? But there's a room that you're sitting on top of. You had told us about that. Before. Okay, yes. I just want to remind you. you have. Thank that, you. But, but that under this room, in this room, there are so many boxes of curriculum that have come through this district that we're no longer using. And I just want to know, how can we justify spending $10 million on something that may wind up in the dirt room again? And how effective is this, is this curriculum? And how is it going to improve reading in our district? Is anyone, are we just throwing money back out to put some boxes under this boardroom? I, I don't think that's the intent, uh, Dr. Frazier. Um, uh, this is a major investment that we have planned for improving uh, student reading. And I asked Ms. Belser to talk a little bit more specifically about the EL uh, curriculum that you that you referenced. Uh, that's a, uh, I'm familiar with the EL curriculum. I'll just pass this question for right now. I don't want to elaborate on that. Thank you so much. Dr. French. I'm looking at slide 29. We're talking about the school-based plan. So you have done an analysis of those plans and calculated the full-time requests or the, the employee requests. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. All right, any other um, questions for Mr. Hamer? I do. Okay. So, and I understand that a lot of the work and effort that we do as a school district is in staff. Um, again, this is ESSER money, it goes away. And so are these really designed to be employees who are coming in to do crisis work and then those jobs are going away? Are we expecting to try to continue to fund those positions after the money is out? Well, I think uh, others might uh, be able to give you a little bit better answer. I, I do want to maybe address what is your, Part of your question specifically is the intention for the FTEs, uh, particularly in the school plans, are for the duration of the program, which you know the, the money runs out um, in the summer of 2024. Uh, I think there are other mechanisms to uh, account for what happens to those individuals uh, whenever the money goes away. I, I think we do have, uh, over the course of uh, any school year, uh, some amount of attrition that those folks could fall into. Uh, I think there might be some other uh, opportunities for um, maybe some additional funding for those uh, going beyond. And maybe some of the positions don't need to go beyond that. But I, I think it's going to be a mix of all of those and all of those uh, elements or all of those uh, kind of circumstances will, play, will come into play with that. Thank you. Yep. Robert Mike, I think, has a question. Oh, oh, oh. Ms. Gunkley has a question. Okay. I was just going to say, because I think there was something like that that we had going on this year and the people were just like, well, that's it. So like Dr. French said, so we come in and we're gonna do this and we're gonna do all this stuff that's so gonna work and our children are gonna learn how to read by the age of fifth and all these scores are gonna go up. And then when that money runs out, we're just gonna stop. So I, 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 think, I think Ms. Cloak, Ms. Coakley, so there's two, two pieces here. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Fr Dr. French had asked about the FTEs and what happened to those um, 
uh, those uh, employees that are hired. And, our, and we can have uh, Mr. Brigman uh, weigh in on that. He's been developing strategies for that. And then the other piece there is the sustainability um, for anything that works. So as we uh, expend these dollars and we do the analysis, for instance, like with the district, the D20 proposal, of what components of that are working and what we want to sustain. And so we haven't got to the point of how we develop the sustainability plans yet, um, but it's, it's part of our program evaluation. And so that work will take place. Okay, any, anybody else have any other questions? Sorry, Kristen, did you get your question answered that you have? Sorry. I guess that it just sounds like there are there is an anticipation that not all of the positions will get, get will go beyond yes. the time period that some may demonstrate their need to find extra funding. I, I guess part of the concern is, of course, that it if it's a, an employee, we almost certainly have to use general operating fund for a whole lot of that because that's what's sustainable. And so it, I'm just concerned about sustainability. I think one thing I've, I've heard staff talk about with that too is that we have a lot of openings for teachers each year. And so I think they would, I hope that some of those could be filled if, if the funding isn't gonna continue would be fun, filled by those folks in those additional ESSER positions. Okay, anything else, Mr. Kennedy? Uh, that concludes the uh, this report, thank you. Okay. Um, since we've been going for a long time, why don't we take a five minute break um, for a quick bathroom break? Is that good with everybody? Okay.
Y'all ready? Ready. Okay. We have it was plenty of candy and no self control over here with mm. Speaking for myself. Next item on the agenda is the Strategic Education Committee. Ms. Herderick. Thank you, Ms. Darby. We have a, a good bit on the Strategic Education uh, Report today. First up is 4A. You all have had the chance to review that in your packet. So unless you have any questions for Ms. Robert, I'd like to make a motion to approve all ap proposed courses for school year 2022-2023. Second. Any questions? All right. Ready? Okay, so we've got a motion. You want me to do or you? You want to do it? Wait. Okay. No. She, she made the motion. Mm -hmm. so she yep. we're ready. Uh, okay, so Dr. I mean, Dr. I, I'm escalating you. Ms. Herderick made the motion, so I'll do the voting part. And <clears throat> Ms. Green did the second. No Ms. question. Um, let's vote. Ms. Waters, we were just voting on um, item 4A, the local board approved courses. Yep. Okay. Got it. Okay, good. Great. That motion is approved. Uh, next up is item 4B. Again, we had this in our packet, and I'd like to make a motion to imp improve the instructional materials recommended for use in the Charleston County School District by the textbook selection committees for the subjects in the attached recommendation and justification documents. Second. Any questions? Um, so in the previous, Ms. Coakley voted yes, I guess. Okay, so just hold on one second. In the previous motion, Ms. Coakley voted yes, and her it said nay. All right, so Ms. Coakley's vote should have been yes for the um, item 4A, all right? Any questions on 4B? Yeah, as we're moving forward, just for accuracy, let's make sure that when it's posted, uh, that everyone voted accordingly uh, before moving on to the next item. Um, I said something, but we were doing something else. But... Okay, so we've got a motion from Ms. Herderick and a second from Ms. Green for item 4B, textbook selections. Any questions? Let's vote. That motion is approved. Is everybody's vote reflective of how they voted? I can't see it. All yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Uh, next up is item 4C, um, the textbook selection for spring 2022. I'd like to make a motion to approve the instructional materials recommended for the use in the Charleston County School District by the textbook selection committee for the subjects in the attached recommendation and justification documents. Okay, okay so Ms. Herderick had made motion and Ms. Waters had the second. Does anybody have any questions? All right, please vote. That motion passes. Is that reflective of everyone's vote? Right. 
Um, next up is the map data review, Ms. Belcher and Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Just gonna wait for the deck to get up. And we have, and a hard copy has been provided. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> French, for that suggestion. Um, moving over to the data review plan. So this is the first of what we believe to be several um, conversations about our student achievement data. So today in the committee of the whole meeting, we're, we're, uh, back a couple slides, Maggie. Sorry. Uh, it should be data review, but there we go. Thank you. Uh, we Our plan is we've actually provided all available data that we have right now in the bo on board doc. So that includes the map results tables and the FastBridge results tables. FastBridge was received just a week ago, so we did not have time to complete an analysis of that. That will be done for the June board meeting so that we can dive into the difference between previous years on FastBridge. As a reminder, that's our testing for K1 and 2. Um, sorry, just K and one. And then we also included uh, an, a study that was completed by NWEA, which is the map publisher, uh, around our fall and winter study as we're taking part of a larger study around COVID recovery. So that full study is also included in board docs, and we'll go over some of the high level data on that in this meeting now. Uh, again, our, our plan, sorry, Maggie, just one more second. Our plan here in, uh, is to schedule at your leisure based on what works for you, small group data meetings to make sure if you have specific questions about the data or things you wanna discuss, that small groups of board members can have that opportunity. Um, at the June 27th board meeting, we'll go over our high level data findings for FastBridge, follow up on any questions from this presentation, and then start um, making sure that folks understand how we're making some investments in the context of our reading priority with outside providers like leading educators and EL. And then in the July committee of the whole, we'll give an update on AVID, where we are with the accelerations effort in the full ELA pilot. Um, that's our plan over the next uh, few board meetings. Um, after, when I stop, if folks have uh, edits after we go over this data on how you'd like to sequence that, I'd appreciate the feedback. So we go into the, the next slide. Again, we've had this data for only about two weeks. So I think there's still some level of analysis that we wanna do in terms of the so what? What does this mean we wanna do differently? But as we look at the results overall, the students who took the MAP test in the spring of 2022 had an average achievement level at, above the national average in both reading and mathematics. We saw progress from winter 2022 so that students improved to similar achievement levels of the fall as in the fall. So if they were at the 60th percentile level in the fall, they're pretty close to the 60th percentile level in the spring, which means that while we did not have accelerated instruction, they maintained their place in line relative to their peers in that norm reference group. That norm reference group, again, is pre-pandemic. We do think we experience less learning loss overall as compared to other districts nationally. We shared that with you at the winter presentation, but at that time we didn't have the, the breakout by race and ethnicity. So we have more to share on that because it did seem that we experienced disproportionate learning loss um, in the last year among our black Hispanic students as compared to our white and Asian students. But as we look at our results from the winter testing, it does seem to indicate, and this is the NWA study, that we have stopped some of this learning loss discrepancy within our demographic groups and all groups are stabilizing. Uh, and I, th I think the final thing would be that we're not yet seeing significant achievement gains across acceleration schools, but we are seeing, sorry, I wanna make sure my slides are not with you and I'm an old lady and can't read. These glasses are new since I came to CCSD, by the way. Uh, this, the, we haven't seen uh, achievement gains across acceleration schools. We're seeing increased growth though in those schools as compared, they were, as compared to where they were previous years and including pre-pandemic. But of course there are some real bright spots in some of those schools, one of which was Sanders Clyde. Uh, Sanders Clyde in mathematics, uh, um, sorry, in reading improved from 19% to 28 percentile this year. 55.6% uh, of their students met their growth targets, and it's now at the 56% uh, uh, in growth relative to their peers in the group, group. Last year, it was at 40th, so real growth in some of our acceleration schools. 
just as a reminder of what how the map test is organized it's a computer adaptive assessment so as a kids answer the question they answer it correctly they get a harder question if they get the answer incorrectly they get an easier question so that it, that's what they say about it being adaptive um, allows us to see where students are on a continuum from k-12 simultaneously and then we look at map for both achievement so as compared to the norm reference group where are those kids in line and growth We've typically reported out on growth as the percentage of students that meet their growth targets. When we do those school composites, the like school pieces, we're actually reporting out on conditional growth percentile, which Maggie, if you go to the next slide. Conditional growth percentile is where the students percentile rank for growth. So if you're at the 50th percentile, that means it's 50% greater than similar students relative to the norm. So just to make sure we are going to report out an individual growth percentile in this presentation, in addition to growth goals, which we typically have done with the bar graphs. Oops, I'm sorry, would you go back? Uh, just a few notes. I, as in previous years, other because of the, the numbers of students in that group are sometimes combined just because it's too small to show without aggregating. Um, and then the state required us to give the grade one and grade nine in these COVID years. So we do have those in the results tables. But in order to compare to previous years, we could just look at second to eight. So that's what we did. So just a few words about this study. And again, the complete study with all its supporting materials is included on board docs. We're part of a coalition of schools that give the MAP test across the country, trying to figure out what's gonna help in terms of COVID recovery. So they compare our MAP schools scores to similar districts, which they call the coalition of the willing. Those districts are largely urban and the specific demographics of those districts are included in the full report. So you can look at um, how we compare to those districts. And then they compare us also to the full MAP data set. So everyone who took the MAP test nationally. Um, this is the first report of progress. So we had one report just where we stood as compared to our peers at the baseline when the study began in the fall. This is now from fall to winter. So this does not include the most recent tests. We won't get that report until August or early September. And the next stage of this is to also look at individual interventions that we're doing with kids to see their relative impact. So for example, every student that's currently enrolled in the summer enrichment program, that's coded within PowerSchool. So that allows the researchers to look at how those kids did relative to kids who didn't enroll in the summer enrichment program to see to what extent the summer enrichment program contributes to COVID recovery. We can also do that sort of work at looking some, at some of our partners, like, for example, reading partners. Who are the students who are enrolling in reading partners? How does that have an impact relative to others? And some of our interventions, like the tutoring program that we're doing with Saga, at least as long as we get the ninth grade MAP results, and the, the tutoring program that we're doing. Um, Mr. Dr. Williams, I, why can't I remember the name of this tutoring program ever? Paper tutoring, correct? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, so that the advantage is we can see what interventions are we paying money for and how are they working, and then other districts are also doing that. So if someone has an outsized win on some of those interventions, we can take advantage of the positive outliers and try to adapt some of that work for our own benefit as well. We just showed a, we included a few slides here just to make sure explain to the board members at the high level what you're looking at if you dive into that study. So you've seen this first slide before. We shared this at the, at, at the winter testing piece when the first sort of um, baseline report was ready. This is comparing the fall of 2019, so pre-pandemic fall scores, to the fall of 2021. Where the arrow starts is where the students were in terms of achievement at, on the y-axis um, in the fall of 2019. In the fall of 2020. 21 is where the bottom of the arrow is or the top of the arrow if the scores went up. So you can see if from comparing ourselves to the Coalition of the Willing, which is the, the blue piece, those again are urban-esque districts and the whole NWEA sample. On average, Charleston started higher in achievement. In some places had greater learning loss than others, particularly in reading. We had less learning loss than others generally. And again, there's some grade level variation within mathematics. At the time when we gave the report, the winter map scores, this slide hadn't been completed. Maggie, would you go to the next one? 
which actually shows learning loss. Again, we're comparing the fall of 2019 to the fall of 2021, so the beginning of this year. So this is pre-pandemic to now, broken out by demographic groups. So on the uh, left is the Yes, and left is the math scores. You can see at the top Asian and white students as compared to Hispanic and black students. And then you see the reading scores, again, Asian and white are at the top and black and Hispanic are at the bottom. This would show that we had outsized learning loss relative with among African American and Latinx kids as compared to white and Asian kids. We did see in general that, that those in some places are double digit learning loss. If you go to the next slide, Maggie. Now this is comparing fall to winter. So now we're looking at what happened in the first half of our year, which just as I know the board knows this, but as a reminder of the public was a period where we still had quite a bit of COVID within the district and heavy absenteeism relatively. You can see that there's learning we had, and you remember our, our results did dip in the um, winter. You can see where we started again in achievement and then going down, but where we evened out. Generally, we stemmed a little bit less of a learning loss within reading as compared to mathematics. The NWEA folks believe that that's partially we were ahead of the rest of the country and that we might be heading back a little bit towards the norm. And it could also be that we were focusing on reading rather than sufficiently focusing on math, but that was where we were. Now, if you look at race and ethnicity, in this case, this is math first, and the next slide will show reading. You can see, again, the achievement levels are different between racial groups. So you can see that by looking at the y-axis, our uh, white students perform on average and our Asian American students uh, higher. But when you look at actual learning loss, like where are the arrows and what are the numbers around the arrows, we're seeing similar, not identical, but similar places where we're seeing learning loss, um, similar levels, but not outsized as we saw before. And this is also true, Maggie, if you'll show us in reading. Thank you. Oop, back one slide. So, you know, obviously you're, you have the data to make your own interpretation. Our read with the support of the NWA folks was that it does seem like we may be at a point where we're stabilizing learning loss across all demographic groups to a similar level and starting to get to a different point. Now, again, this is fall to winter. It does not consider the most recent semester's worth of learning. So Ms. Belcher just shared our CCSD fall to winter results as compared to similar urban school districts and the nation. Now we'll share our current year's fall to spring results as compared to previous years as well as nationally. So the graphs on the screen represent three years of fall and spring reading and math median achievement percentiles based on NWA's map assessment in grades two through eight. You'll see a dotted line on this slide and throughout this presenta presentation to signify the national average. The first two bars represent the 2018-19 school year in fall and spring or where we were pre-pandemic. The next two bars represent last year's achievement and the last two bars represent the current school year's achievement. Overall, in all three years represented, Charleston County School District performed higher than the nation as a whole in both reading and math. Additionally, for the current school year, CCSD performed only slightly lower than it did pre-pandemic in reading and actually achieved higher in math than it did before the pandemic. When we look at the same three-year comparison across race and ethnicity and reading, we do see disparities across our subgroups as we have in the past. But we're seeing in our most recent spring administration an upward trend from fall to spring for our Black, Hispanic, and other subgroup populations, something we did not see last year. Our white subgroup although not at the pre-pandemic level, has stabilized over the past two years and is performing close to where it was prior to the pandemic.
for math achievement, although we do not see an upward trend for our black subgroup, we do see a stabilization from spring of last year. For our other subgroup, we see achievement levels similar to pre-pandemic. Our Hispanic and white subgroups show an increase from the previous year and our white subgroup um, achieving at a level higher than before the pandemic. For your, for your information, we also provided this year's fall and spring median achievement percentiles by grade level and reading. Um, as you can see, all grade levels are performing above the national average of the 50th percentile. This slide shows our math medium achievement percentiles. All grade levels, again, are performing above the national average of the 50th percentile. The graphs you see now represent three years of fall to spring median growth percentiles in reading and math. The first bar represents the 2018-19 school year or pre-pandemic, while the middle bar represents last year's fall to spring growth results, and the last bar represents this current school year's fall to spring growth. Overall, for the three years represented, the district has shown growth near or above the national average in both reading and math. For the current year, Overall, in grades two through eight, CCSD exhibits growth similar to its pre-pandemic level. When we look at the median growth percentiles in reading across race and ethnicity, our Black, Hispanic, and other subgroups increased from last year, while our white population remained constant. With the exception of our Hispanic population, all subgroups are showing growth rates similar to their pre-pandemic levels. For math, although we see decreases in growth from last year overall and in our Hispanic and white subgroups, we do see increases in growth for both our black and other subgroup populations. Additionally, all subgroups are growing at rates similar to where they were prior to the pandemic. For your information, we've also provided the percentage of students overall and by race and ethnicity who met their reading growth targets. And what this means is this is a percentage of our students who have met what we consider a typical year's growth. You'll see the same thing here, but this time it's for math. And Ms. Roberts, can you explain when we say typically it's for that child as compared to similar kids, not necessarily against a grade level standard. So I think it's worth saying that MAP groups kids based on where they start and anticipates what the growth would be. And so that's what the growth target is based on, not necessarily like second grade level material. That's correct. We also provided the, um, the same thing here um, for by grade level for both um, reading and math so that you could have that information. And then we've also provided the median growth percentile by grade level as well, so that you could see what that, um, again, that dotted line shows you the average, national average. And that's you. Mm -hmm. I can you go to the next slide. So then as we start to dive into our acceleration schools achievement pre-pandemic last year and now, what we see is not necessarily um, a little bit of an uptick in math, still not, not quite at the level of pre-pandemic and pretty stable in reading. So we're not necessarily seeing any additional growth um, over the last two years of investment. I'm sorry, achievement in the last two years of investment. But as we look at growth as compared to pre-pandemic, we do see significant growth among relative to the pre-pandemic levels of growth in those schools from 25 to 44 and from last year to this year, but still not quite at pre-pandemic in reading. So that gives us some positive signals that despite the fact that we were in a year and a half pandemic, our schools that are furthest behind are growing at a greater average than they were prior to the intervention of acceleration schools. So this is not enough because we would wanna see the achievement scores also move. But from our perspective, given it takes typically three years to see a turnaround, we still have positive signals that the bets that we have on the table are working to improve student performance in the acceleration schools. 
the rest of the deck actually dives into more detail around breaking it out uh, among similar, uh, different demographic groups to make sure that we provided that information so you can compare uh, in terms of kids in poverty and special needs students, as well as English language learners. And I think at this point, we're prepared to answer questions that folks have about the data so far. Thank you, Ms. Belcher. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. What questions do we have? Waters? Um, uh, thank you for the data. Not, um, not a question necessarily, but a comment. And I know we've been talking about this um, quite a bit. I appreciate the breaking out of the data uh, by subgroup uh, because it's important to note that even though we're above the 50% level, only one or two subgroups is constantly above the 50th percentile. Um, and then obviously pre-pandemic, they weren't doing well. And so certainly being able to compare them to, you know, to pre-pandemic is not what we would want. And so I'm just wondering, uh, and I know I mentioned this, but I'm going to name that I really think that there should be some sort of um, task force or specialized attention. And I realize the acceleration schools are supposed to be that, but I think that there's something that we're not doing by focusing just on academics. There's a lot that um, goes into putting a kid in a position to really be receptive to information and be prepared to learn it as we heard about all the wraparound services. But we sort of use that term a lot. But where is the constant tied at the hip, you know, somebody leading academic achievement, but somebody also thinking about what is the mental uh, health status, the social and emotional well-being of kids so that they're prepared to learn, but that it always needs to be a conversation had at the same time, not just when we're talking about a surplus of funds and thinking about too, how the measures that we're putting in place to really uh, sort of get the instruction through to kids is impacting uh, them as well, because we don't, we certainly don't want to slide back to sort of no child left behind days. Um, I'm just thinking about how we can really structure the system to better respond because we, we sort of always end up here. And, and, and I know we're going to end up here until we get them to the mark, but what are we going to do that's drastically different to start pushing them there? I would love to have some different kind of conversations that, you know, people who want to be from the board, but primarily folks from the district would be involved in. And I think it's a good idea. And we could have conversations about what that might look like in small groups and then come back to the board with a plan for the July meeting coming out of conversations about the specific data, because that way the board can have a better understanding of the different things that we're doing at the district level around COVID recovery for mental health and social emotional and how those may tie together or may not. Just to add, I, what I didn't say also is the cultural competence piece that we that we're setting it up like a nice to have, but it's a have to have. I think it will be the difference maker um, moving forward. Appreciate that. Trevor Mack. So I guess my comments are a little bit different, um, but I agree. But I want to add on in a different way. I guess I, I'm just sick and tired of seeing this type of report reporting in the disparity between uh, the black, Hispanic, white, and others. Uh, we're not moving students like we should. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just tired of seeing uh, uh, the, the large gap of where kids are growing and where they're moving, uh, particularly the blacks are always at the bottom. Um, my, my concern is that we've been talking about this for so many years and uh, actually have not seen where uh, we are making gains as one will say that we are and we're still yet falling below uh, the line on the graph on what you're showing. My question then becomes, what is being put in place? And I, I've asked this question maybe a hundred times uh, to improve uh, the areas where we know are lacking because the data is in front of us. You guys have them, you guys have studied them, or else you want to be able to put this graph together as to where the concerns are, where the needed measures need to be put into place. We have millions and millions of dollars that we are advocating or, 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 or allotting to different areas to improve uh, learning loss, you know. I just need to see where we are really putting 
the money to the areas of where we already know based on the data that you have already received and you've already studied and you've already put together, where are we putting those dollars to those resources to impact those losses of, of where the learning is occurring? And this has been happening for years now. I'm very much concerned about that because I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm just sick and tired of seeing this type of data. I'm sick and tired of seeing this type of result. So I need to know what are we doing differently? I want to know what are we doing differently? Maggie, can you go to slide 14, please? Reverend Mack, as I've said to you, I also think at least a couple of times, this is not a quick race. It's a marathon and not a sprint. As compared to other districts nationally, Okay, I think, I think we may want to start this conversation differently. Um, no, no, I'm not. Let me just show you. When I look at the racial breakout as compared, oops, sorry, Maggie. No worries. Right there. So the racial groups here, when we're looking at math achievement, this is from the fall to the winter by racial groups. We see similar where we're, we're sort of stymied. Actually, can you go back, Maggie? This is not the right one. It's my fault. Back two slides. This one. So is this us? This is just us. Do we have the comparison with the other in here? This is the one I was on. Sorry. I'm sorry, folks. Right here. Like we're not, we're actually doing better than school districts that are similar to us that are urban and school districts nationally. Now, I know that doesn't feel good. I, I don't think I've been trying to excuse our low achievement, but I'm not sure what the strategy was prior to these two years to improve these schools. We have a strategy now. It's very clear we're doing a new curriculum. We're doing professional development around that curriculum that has a proven track record in urban school districts. We piloted it with our most neediest schools first. By this fall, all of our Title I schools will have that pilot. We invested in tutoring programs and extended day. The schools that are, the kids that are furthest behind are in summer enrichment, which last summer, for as long as they went, helped stymie summer learning loss. Relative to our peers, we are doing fairly well. Now, it doesn't feel good because the achievement gaps have lasted for multiple decades, but to assume that a turnaround effort, which typically takes three to five years in a pandemic year, is going to show outsized achievement gains is simply unrealistic. Point to any other district across the country who has done that, and I will happily follow their path, but there is not one. Well, that's uh, hold, hold follow up. So that's, that's not my job. That's your job to find out that. I'm not concerned about and, what's and going on. And I know on. the answer to it, sir. That's what I'm trying to tell you is that there's not one. Let, let me finish. I'm not concerned about what's going on in California. I'm concerned about what's going on in Charleston County School District. I'm concerned about the data that has been repeatedly shown over and over and over again. Your job and, and the staff is to figure out a way how to improve the scores and to put resources in places that it needs to be. Now, if you're telling me that every year we're going to get new curriculum put in place, are you, are you telling me that we're going to put new plans in the place every day? Because what I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing over the course of the years improvement of where we need to be. Now, if that's what you're telling me, then, then that's another conversation we need to have. So my read on our math results which was a curriculum change that happened prior to this, is that for all kids, we saw gains in mathematics, not enough, but we did see gains. We're not changing that mathematics curriculum. We're doubling down to get it farther. We're only halfway through an ELA adoption right now where we did the module units and not the skills block, which is the phonics component and the phonemic awareness. We didn't wanna to have too much change for teachers. So we just piloted the modules. That will be all in this year coming up and all Title I schools are opting into the new curriculum. There's not another answer after that. We chose to do math first and then to do reading this year within the acceleration schools because there wasn't, we didn't wanna to have too much change on top of teachers in addition to the fact that we were dealing with a pandemic and there's a lot of professional development around improving quality of instruction. Um, so 
I, 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 I want to make sure we continue to pay attention to math because we saw some dips among some high performing kids and mathematics, but there's definitely been progress made and we have more to do. I guess I would also point out the acceleration schools. It is a significant investment and we are seeing significantly more growth than we've seen previous to the pandemic, which to me says the strategy is working. At the June meeting, leading educators, which we've been consulting with since I came into the district two years ago, uh, will present to the board on some of the other things that they've seen in terms of observation data. So showing where the teacher behavior has changed over time. And typically I can share research with the board in the board brief. When teacher behavior changes, it's usually a year before you see it in student achievement. Thank you, uh, Dr. French. Dr. Frazier had her hand up first, so I'm gonna go to her and then I'll come to you. Okay, um, I can't remember the board approving this new curriculum so that when you say it's going to be implemented by all of the schools, I know that you're piloting the program now, but I can't remember this board ever approving this new curriculum. And then secondly, I want to charge this board with, with something. We need to determine how much information do we need? Do we need to go through all of this to know that we're not doing well? And when I look at all of this, and, and, and it's just pages and pages of this, I used to give the math. And we just look at all of this and all this. Do we need all of this information? At one time, I proposed to the board that we bring someone in and they were gonna come in free to talk to us about what do we actually need to get from our staff to move us further. Do we need a, a staff person to go through all of this to make things right for us? And I want to have that conversation so that we can get an expert in here to talk to this board because we don't need all of this. It's confusing. I can't even follow this. I didn't even try to follow this. And then lastly, I want to say, if you're going to talk to me about the differences in test scores, then I need to see me represented on this page. And I don't see that. So let's get it together here. I'm frustrated about this reading program and we're behind. And then when I look at the pictures that we present to the board, I don't see the majority of this board being reflected here. And I'm, I'm insulted by it. I really, really am. Just wanted to make that comment. Dr. French. Not only are we all be left behind in reading, but we're left behind when you present things to the board. So I would like to just, um, there are two things. One is, yes, the, it is the board's job to say, this is how we want, this is the data we want to see. And we want you to present it the same way every time. And even within this presentation, yeah. you use two different graphing systems. That's completely confusing. It's frustrating for me in, at the least, but, um, and I also want to say, because you got pretty confrontational with Reverend Mack, that data slide does not show that we're doing better for black kids at all. It does not. The, the difference between our numbers and numbers in the other cohorts are not significantly different. You're gonna have to show me some real statistics to prove to me that that's a statistical difference. So don't tell us that we're doing better. We are not. I, man, if, if any way I've given the impression that I don't think the achievement of our Black or Latino or our kids in poverty or our special ed kids is okay, that is not what I believe. That's I've not never what I'm saying. That. You said that we were doing better. And I we're said, not for those hold in on, achievement. Hold on, hold on. We need to take a step back. Ms. Belcher asked frequently how we want to see data. This, please send her an email, Ms. Roberts, of how you want to see this. But let's be respectful. All these folks are incredibly hardworking. They're doing what they can to get us this information. Let's take a step back and a breather. I just didn't appreciate the way she was speaking to the chair. What? I've got a question. Who's, who's next? I have a question. Dr. French, did you finish? I'm done. 
So Ms. can Darby. I finish my comment though, Ms. Hedrick, before we move to Ms. Darby? Sure. I didn't intend to be confrontational. I'm sorry, Reverend Mack, if it came across that way. I, I feel like I represent the teachers and the principals across the system who are working very hard to improve student achievement in a very, very tough time. This is the time in our, the worst year in my career that I've been in public education. I've been in public education for 30 years in terms of the outside challenges that we've been facing, in terms of severe mental health crises for our kids, in terms of COVID, having high teacher and high student absenteeism and a lot of grief because people have lost folks in the system. And we're in the midst of a change process that does take typically three to five years. And I'm telling you, we're going to see results at year three. And I'm optimistic that we're going to see some results on SC Ready and, and uh, end of course exams and other things. But I don't want us to change directions radically because I think we've got some signals that relative to our peers, and you're right, ma'am, I should not have said better. I'm not trying to over sugarcoat the results. I'm just trying to put them in the context of the last two years that we've been in and that there is a strategy for improvement to, to really accelerate instruction for the kids that we're most worried about. And it, it's going to take time to get there, but I am not trying to, to kick the can and say, we don't have results in a year. I should be out of a job. Like, that's true. But I, I do think we will see progress because part of what we've learned about tool turnaround is it takes time and it takes pace. Teacher behavior changes first. And we are, we are stopping the learning loss by some of these interventions. And again, this is just the first of several data pieces. Part of the job of the board is to hold us accountable. We're trying to share all of our strategy and the data that we have. And that way you can push back on where we're falling short and what we're not doing. But I also do think it's my job to put this in a national context that it doesn't feel good because this achievement gap is, has existed for decades, but relative to other systems across the country, because of your hard work and opening school and the hard work of the teachers and the principals on the ground, we were able to stem relative learning loss and start us on a place of recovery this year. Is it enough? Absolutely not. And so I'm sorry, sir, if it didn't seem that way, but I am trying to represent people who I don't want to lose heart out in the field who are working very, very hard to make sure that they can actually move the needle towards closing that gap and forgive me if I was out of line we're we're gonna thank you Ms. Belcher we're gonna take a five minute break um can we um just everybody excuse everyone please
thanks everyone. Obviously frustrations are really high. Everyone's incredibly passionate about doing more and closing the disparity gap. So I think it got a little heated. Ms. Belcher, thank you for the report. I think everybody will send some emails as far as getting reports on data. Um, so we appreciate your time on this, Ms. Roberts. Uh, we have a few additional questions and we'll move on to summer programming. Uh, Ms. Waters. Thank you. One of the questions that I have um, sort of at the end of all this is, I know we have um, the mechanisms in place as a strategy moving forward and I know you wanna double down on it, but what I don't recall, and forgive me if I don't recall it, but um, what is the goal for student achievement? I mean, do we have sort of an, I mean, I know the reading by grade five, but we have the math results, we have the reading results. You know, I know there's, you know, sort of the standard, 50th percentile or above, but what is the, where do we want our kids to be when we look at these results this time next year or, or the new board looks at these results this time next year? We definitely want to see significant progress in closing racial disparity gaps, as well as the gap between our high poverty students and our students who are not in poverty. Um, we do want to see more grade level performance on average across the entire district. Um, that would mean we'd have accelerated growth so, greater, so um, greater than the 50th percentile in terms of the conditional growth metric would be an indicator within our map results of being on track to that. Um, and you know, from a perspective of like on the ground that the reading curriculum is being taught with fidelity, but individualized to meet specific needs of kids. So we're seeing accelerated learning, not just grade level learning. Because if I had to frame how we did this year, we just made, we made a year's worth of progress on the relative to the normed reference group, which is not going to close the achievement gap and not going to close the COVID recovery gap that, it, that exists for some of our kids. Thank you. I'd like to just continue to think about that, especially when we think about new board goals, like having that number out in front of us, because I can't, I'm, it's a shame to say, because it's we, we have to own that too, but I can't think what is the number that we were shooting for when these results came out. I, I can't call one. It's hard to set go outcome goals on an average of the district to say we're going to be at this place because it really does mean we need to look at the movement of individual quintiles. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's really interesting if you look in the NWEA report and, and is to look at the achievement by quintile level, so five different levels of achievement, mm -hmm. and it sort of shows you where the growth is happening among those different groups. And you can see that kids are moving at different rates. In fact, our kids that are furthest behind are moving the most, which is good. That's what we want, but we have more work we have to do to close those gaps. Thank you. Do we have any additional questions? I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I think we talked, somebody mentioned it, but, and you and I've talked about this, but I just want to clarify, when will we ap approve the EL or pr be presented with next steps for the EL pilot? I know you all, all the um, Title I schools are implementing this fall and then the rest of the schools the next fall. So when will that come back to the board? This summer sometime? Or? Well, the hope was to present uh, in the, the data planning thing, one of the pieces we wanted to do is make sure you understood how EL was working on the ground in the July committee of the whole. Okay. And we can decide in that meeting whether to do an initial vote or to do it in August. Perfect, thank you. So um, I have a couple of things I would like to say. Uh, number one, I agree with everybody that um, it's been decades when, when we see the same type of uh, data and not getting the results that we want. Um, and there are strategies in place. Uh, there are other strategies that are being uh, contemplated. Uh, for instance, uh, the D20 proposal is a, certainly a different way to take, take a look at this uh, issue of uh, lack of achievement. Uh, last week in a meeting with uh, NWA with uh, uh, Ms. Belcher and other staff members, uh, that was looking at the um, the map data and, and the um, analysis that they are doing. I asked the NWA people to do. I think what you're asking, Ms. Ward, is to take a look at our data and tell us by school what it would take to go from where that school is now to where they need to be in terms of achievement, whatever you know, significant achievement, so that we can see what it takes to be able to do that in order to make the investments that that I hear you asking for, uh, Reverend Mack. I think we need to make sure that we understand where it is we need to get to. And then as you all know, we have the systems thinking and other uh, strategies in place to probe the system to find out why after so many years, we still based on all the 
all the uh, resources that we apply to the district, all the people that have been uh, invested themselves in the district while we haven't made, those, made that progress. So we are working towards trying to figure out where those resources need to be uh, aligned, where they need to be invested so that uh, the things that the academic team have been working on for the last two years, we, we hope to continue those because if there are some indications that things are, are, are turning, we're not getting the achievement that we need. Uh, and as uh, Carolyn indicated, uh, we hope to have in the SE uh, ready scores this year, uh, some um, indications that we are making some progress. So more to come this summer uh, and the SC ready scores won't be out until, until uh, around the 1st of September. Uh, but I, I hear everybody both on the academic side and on the board side and about the data and the need to make sure that we focus on the, the proper uh, growth. Thank you. Any additional questions? Um, last up is summer programming. Uh, the board received an extensive report on summer programming and one of being one of the levers um, to help with this. Would, would you like to hear this report or did everyone review? I mean, I, is, I'd, like to, I'd like to hear it okay. just because I think it's a big piece of, right. of what we're just talking about if we can. Wonderful. Ms. Woody and Mr. Cobb are here to present and answer questions. Good afternoon. Today was the first day of SEC for our students. And so during our little break, I just wanted to check in with our program coordinators. It was a fantastic day. Let me just start with that. A lot of very happy, excited uh, students, a lot of teachers. I, we, we employed 500 people for the summer enrichment program, which is uh, 500 people who were already really tired, to be honest. Um, and they're doing... <clears throat> They're doing a great job when they're already kind of stretched to their limits. And today you wouldn't know how tired they are. They were welcoming, they were excited. They were all the things we would want for our students in the summer. Um, I think we have a slide deck here, so I'll just run through it quickly. Uh, we have 16 sites this summer. We've expanded and added five additional days. Um, we have two K-8 sites, and the rest are either elementary or middle. Uh, and there's a listing there of our different SEC sites. Uh, at this point in time, we registered 2,800 students, and we had just enough adults to do uh, that work between teachers and teacher assistants. Um, you can just go to the next slide. Um, one of the big things we wanted to make sure to do in the elementary uh, curriculum was to mirror what we know about the science of reading. We don't have enough teachers yet who are well-trained in the EL curriculum to use that uh, in the summer programming. So we are using explicit systematic phonics and phonemic awareness pieces uh, to that. And we're do using a STEM unit. So that engagement piece uh, to um, blend the pieces together for us. Um, at the middle school, we are using the illustrative math curriculum uh, for the math piece. And we are using um, a novel set engagement and no engaging novel study for uh, the other part. This year we embedded enrichment. We learned last year that we put the enrichment at the end of the day and that caused some logistical issues. So this year the schedule mirrors much like what you'd see during the school year, a related arts kind of schedule. And you can see there some of the engagement partners, the community partners that we're using uh, in the elementary. In the middle school for engagement, we're actually using CCSD teachers. So we have bucket drumming, we have um, backyard games, we have things that, so some of them are PE teachers, some of them are English teachers who want to do something different and offer an engagement uh, piece. And uh, next slide. And then our high school program is a credit recovery type program run in our individual uh, high schools. The next slide I think just shows you some of those changes. Um, I've said a couple of them, we've added some days, we've added some additional time for teachers for instruction and planning. We even have art therapy in four of our schools uh, this summer. All of the meals are being cooked at the site so we don't have to have personnel transporting um, that. And um, we had made sure that our front office staff has an extra layer of security training, especially in light of uh, our recent events in the nation. So it was a great day to start. Um, we are regrouping now. Every parent who or family whose child did not 
attend today. It's being contacted, encouraged to come, kind of regrouping around that because we really do want all 2,800 of them to engage in the program. They want to talk about money. I'll let that go. <laughs> Good evening, board. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Kennedy Hello. and everyone, uh, Chairman, Dr. Mack. Um, yeah, I'm here to talk about money. Mr. Kennedy always knows John. He's like, what's the money? How much did it cost? Uh, what's the per people cost? So um, it, uh, it doesn't co did not cost as much as last year. We had like a um, $6.3 million. I'll be looking at last year. It was around the same one, $6.3 million. And we had the same amount of kids, around 2,800 kids um, in the program. Um, this is a district-wide collaborative effort. We work with communication, we work with Michael Ryden's Ryden Box Group, we work with uh, the folks and facilities, we walked all the facilities and um, picked the rooms that we were going to use. We also um, work with transportation, because transportation is a big ticket item to make sure all the kids are going to be transported uh, safely, we made arrangement for our special needs kids, so district-wide, someone in every department had something to do with the planning of this summer program. So um, that's where we are with the funds. It's about the same as all ESSA two funds that we're paying with this um, going into next year. <laughs> we will probably be using ESSA three funds. So that's the funding source for the SEC camp. Are there any other questions? We are here to entertain your questions. Maggie, can we just go through? I, I did want to highlight that there are a few other summer programs happening in, in the district. So the uh, arts program is back again. Um, uh, if you go to the next slide, Maggie, there, there's a program description. We're subsidizing it for those kids who can't afford it and making sure that it's more accessible to more kids. In addition to that, there's also the SAIL program. So that's the gifted and talented program. I, again, making sure that we're serving more kids and doing more proactive outreach to make sure that more kids can take advantage of that opportunity. These programs started last week. Um, and I think we do have um, a couple of extra programs that are targeting specific communities, including the multilingual learner program at these three sites um, that's run through the Office of English Language Learners, um, early learning programs at Mary Ford, as well as at uh, Midland Park to make sure that we're paying attention to our pre-K kids. And then finally, um, just calling out that our... I, thought I had us. Uh, our high school kids, we have about, is it 600? 677. Yeah, it's high school kids doing credit recovery this summer in addition to the 2,800 students enrolled in summer enrichment camp. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Reverend Mack? Uh, yes. Is it, was there a cap on the number of students that could be a part of the program? There was no cap. We did invite 5,000 kids and we were trying to keep it within, within a manageable number. So we were looking at inspecting to get about 3,500 kids because we, one, we wanted to address as many kids as we could, but we did not want to um, tire our staff out. So you have retired staff coming back into the new year. So it was a balancing act. Okay. Uh, what, what was the requirement uh, to get into the program uh, or to those 3,500 to be identified? I mean, oh, but my question was, are we re did we invite specific 3,500 students to tap into areas we know that, that they needed improvement? And so I'm just trying to figure that out. So there were several factors, but the main one was looking at their academic performance range. And really this camp serves our students who are, who need the most. So we have our LI students um, from all the way through about a certain percentage. We probably not gonna voice that here because that then tends to label a student, but there was really specific criteria for the 5,000 that we, that we invited. Okay, what, was there a specific marketing, just say for high school students, I noticed there's only 677 and I know there's a number of high school students that, are, that may, need that, that credit recovery to get them to be on level to where they need to be, particularly working toward graduation, which will definitely help increase our percentage numbers. But uh, was there a specific marketing toward anything along that lines? That was specific. That was um, pretty much planned specific, specifically by the schools. Okay. So like, whereas we did the funding for it, each school um, chose the kids, invited the kids on their own that needed to go to the credit republic. Um, recovery. All right. Any additional questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All. 
Maybe we can go visit this summer. You absolutely can. In fact, we have the Wallace Foundation has been advising the leaders of the summer enrichment camp to try to make sure we were learning from best practices. So they're going to be here to do some walkthroughs to give us feedback. Um, so at some point, we'll make sure the board knows when that is. So you can have the opportunity to learn from them because we found that experience to be very valuable. It's great. It's exciting to see the enrichment and the academics because summer is supposed to be fun as well. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your time and reports. Ms. Darby. Yep, next is Audit and Finance Committee, Ms. Green. Um, as always, um, the action items and the information items are there for your review. And of course, we will have the information to go with those um, for our meeting in whenever we meet, 23rd or whenever. But if anybody has any questions about any of this, you can certainly reach out to me or Shauna. <clears throat> the content wasn't there for any of them. It was just the sub. It's in the audit finance. Oh, it's in the okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just just one quick question on the uh, Laura Brown funding. I know that was, that was always a competitive challenge every year. I know we had like 50,000 set aside for that. I mean, has that been uh, to where these students can literally get to these competition? I mean, is that funding level? Uh, yeah, we didn't use all of it. We did not use all of it. We okay. didn't use all of it for this year. So okay. that's what this is. I mean, by the time it gets to the board, it's going to some of it's going to already have happened. But I mean, Miss Miss uh, Doc Taylor can speak to it. But we we were. Um, well, no, that's we good. To, if you didn't use all of it, because yeah. usually it was a challenge before in the previous years, we didn't have enough right. to cover to get those students to those competitions. They would have to raise additional funding. Okay. Uh, so, but I was just trying to avoid that if if all possible. But it sounds like we didn't he did not use all the funding for that. Dr. Taylor managed the funds well. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next um, item six is policies. Dr. French. Thank you. Um, we have one item, policy EBCB, which is safety plans and drills. So this is a new policy for our policy manual. And the, the reason it's coming to us at this time is because fire code regulations have changed for the state. And so a lot of this, the impetus was fire code. However, there are other security related and disaster related policies, you know, protocols included. And so just wanted to let people know what the why this was coming up now. And if I believe everybody had time to review it, if you have any questions, um, I believe Mr. Reidenbach is here if you need to ask a question that's specific to the policy. If there are no questions, I would entertain a motion. I know. Uh, to approve the, okay. Second. Ms. Darby moves to approve the first reading of the policy and Ms. Herderick seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, um, I'll ask for the vote. And then because this is policy, there'll be a reading, the first reading will be at the next meeting, uh, the next board meeting in two weeks, and then second reading in July. Okay, so that motion passes. Oh, thank you, I'm sorry. Yes, that motion passes. So I return the meeting to you, Ms. Darby. Um, Next item is 7A, legislative update. I think we have our um, update via Zoom today. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Can y'all hear me okay? Yes. 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 Good. Okay, good, good. Um, so I'll be very brief, but uh, last week, uh, the House and Senate budget conferees adopted a conference report um the full list of budget provisos and the spreadsheet will know they will uh, likely not be posted until next week um so we will get that to you as soon as possible but uh the committee uh adopted the house version of the new education funding formula 
um, and the Senate version of the weights for poverty and, and disabilities um, and things of that nature. So um, they will convene uh, this week on Wednesday to vote on that budget conference report um, in both bodies. Um, we expect them to probably not go past Wednesday, but it's likely they could they could go from uh, they could they could uh, adjourn on Thursday as well, um, just taking up that budget. So uh, the budget will then go to the governor for vetoes. Um, so that means the House and Senate will return on June 28th to either uh, sustain or override those vetoes. So um, that's that's really what we what we're looking at this week, and uh, we will keep you all posted on the, the coming events this week. The General Assembly could also return in, in July, uh, but those will be for matters related to um, federal rulings on, on Roe v. Wade. So, but we will keep you posted on when they, they plan on returning um, after this week. Uh, and I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you may, may have at this time. Anybody have any questions? Uh, I do have one, yeah, one question, and maybe Mr. Kennedy can answer. How do so for the budget projections for us? The House version on education funding was not as favorable as the Senate. Is that correct? I think the uh... hi, I can answer that. Oh, thank you. Uh, so the projections, the initial projections that we provided with the 9.1 mil increase was based on the house version, which at the time was more favorable to the district. When we came back before the board and you all approved the 6.3 mil increase, that was based on the Senate version, which at the time was more favorable to the district. Um, the current version that was just approved um, last week is now the house amended version is what's more favorable to the district. So we'll be modifying our projections again. We've already started working on that um, Friday of last week. Lots of fun for you guys, keeping up with what the Senate <laughs> yeah. and the House is doing. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today and keeping us updated. We appreciate no it. No problem. Okay, no problem. so um, next item 7B is determining um, the agenda items to move mm -hmm. forward to the consent agenda. Based on the notes I took, it looks like it would be item and tell me if i'm wrong julie item 4a 4b 4c and 6a That's correct. okay so can i get a motion to move those items 4a 4b 4c and 6a to the con consent agenda for the june 27th meeting so moved okay we have a motion from dr french we have a second second and a second from Ms. herder any questions all right if everybody will please vote on that. I was going to, that's funny. Oh, sorry. Great, that passes. And then um, uh, our upcoming meetings, we have a special call board meeting after this meeting, so don't leave. Um, we have a board meeting on the 27th. Ms. Herder, will you remind us of our upcoming training? Yes. Let me look at my calendar. Thank you. <laughs> and how much candy and Diet Coke will have there? Monday lunch, <laughs> So it's the June 29th and 30th and we're working on a location and lunch great okay not, so from nine to two both days june 29 30 9 to 2 please make sure that's on your calendar and then remember that in july we have a combined committee of the whole and regular board meeting and that will be on july 18th does anybody and just board members need to confirm their attendance at the training on the 29th and 30th okay um does anybody have any any other items not can i um do i have a motion to adjourn all right 
All in favor? Aye. Meeting adjourned. Five minutes.
call the June 13, 2022 Board of Trustees special call meeting to order. Uh, entertain a motion for the adoption of the agenda. So moved. Moved by Ms. Darby. Second. Second by Dr. French. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we ask that you please cast your vote. And we're going to do something new uh, to just when the, the votes come up, just make sure that's the vote that you actually cast. All right. It's unanimous. At this time, entertain a motion to go into executive session. All right. Moved by Ms. Darby, second by Ms. Waters. All right. We're going to ask uh, everyone that's not a part of executive session, if you would just please uh, briefly excuse yourself and we will call you back very quickly. Thank you.
We'll reconvene back. Well, we need Julie and Julie too. <laughs> <laughs> we will uh, reconvene back into uh, open session. Uh, is there a motion for item 5A? Um, Mr. Chair, I motion to allow staff to negotiate the sale of the property in, at, in McClellanville. Okay, is there a second? Second, second. All right, moved by Ms. Green, second by Ms. Darby and Ms. Hedder. Uh, are there any questions? Hearing none, we ask that you please cast your vote. Okay, that item uh, passes 6-1. Uh, uh, is that reflective of everyone's vote? Uh, further executive uh, session item, there was one uh, request made by a board member that we will have further discussion on at our, at our next board meeting. Uh, move to item 6A, uh, approval of the procurement contracts as greater than 250,000. Yes, sir. Are, are there any questions? Was there a question about the curriculum? All right, Dr. French, you have a question? I'm sorry, I was just asking Ms. Darby. Oh, oh Ms. Darby, did you have a question? Oh, okay, never mind. Sorry. All right. I have asked no. questions and they were answered, and so I'm happy. Okay, all right. Ms. Green. Um, I don't have questions. I'll just make a motion if everybody has okay, had their questions good. answered. All right. I motion that we approve the request of uh, items that's listed on the contractual items um, that's on the list for two hundred fifty thousand and above. Second. All right. Moved by Ms. Green. Um, Second by Ms. Hedrick. All right, are there any questions? <laughs> Hearing none, we ask that you please cast your vote. Okay, that motion passes. Is that the votes reflective of what you voted on? I know we've been having some issues, just want to make sure. If it's accurate, then I entertain a motion for adjournment. This meeting is now officially adjourned.